Okay, hello class. Welcome to our second lecture on uh, personal identity. Last week, we had the asynchronous completely lecture that was uploaded to YouTube on uh, Locke, and I had you read Bernard Williams as well, which might have been a little evil because that paper is really hard and it's long, but it's really important and it's really cool. Um, and you get some of Bernard Williams really just like beautiful thinking. Uh, Bernard Williams is, is an was an amazing philosopher who blends together like conversational literary elements of, of speech and writing and thought with uh, analytic conceptual analysis. And you have bits of that in, in this paper, but it's also just sort of foundational for personal identity. Um, so if you did make it all the way through, congratulations, it's like a, an achievement. Um, and we'll see a lot of those thought experiments worked out in, in our lecture today. Um, but the, the main idea of our last lecture was to give you uh, a conception or two conceptions of uh, forms of identity, ways of thinking about what the self is. So we should recall that uh, when we're, what was the, the name of the Descartes lecture was, what is all this, right? Um, the big question that Descartes asks himself is, who is this I? What is this I that I've proven exists? I think, therefore I am, I am a thinking thing, but how do we fill in this notion of a self or of an identity that we're referring to as the object through whom thinking is happening? And uh, for Locke and Williams, we see opposite answers. Uh, for Locke, who the lecture was mostly covering last week, um, does anybody remember what Locke's idea of identity is? Yeah. That's right, memory and experience. So it's a matter of psychological continuity, something to do with the mind persisting through time. And for Locke, as long as you have uh, the right sort of memories that uh, you can like look back on your life, then that counts as you. If you can't remember it, then it's not you. But what's important about this is it's, it's a mental criterion, a psychological criterion for the self. This is to be opposed uh, with Bernard Williams' view of what the self is. So um, for Bernard Williams, the self has to do with uh, physical identity. So what matters is your body. And there's a couple of interesting arguments that show up in this paper that I didn't talk about last week that I'll just sort of briefly introduce now. Uh, one of these arguments is um, it has to do with body swaps. So say, uh, uh, me and uh, my friend Jim sit down in a lab room and an evil philosophical scientist says to us, uh, hey, I'll give you both a thousand dollars if you let me put your brains in each other's bodies. And we say, great, I'm poor. I could use a thousand bucks. Put my brain in that person's body. So Jim and I have our brains swapped. Am I now in Jim's body or is Jim now in my body? Like who's who? Um, this is how the example works. It's a body swap case. This is also why uh, philosophers should not be scientists and should not be given science grants because we will do awful, terrible things. Uh, our thought experiments are not kind to the human existential condition. Um, but they are interesting. So uh, Bernard Williams invites us to imagine what if, uh, uh, what if in this body swap, when you wake up in, in the, or when like Jim wakes up in my body, like Jim's brain is in my body um, and I'll be in Jim's body. Uh, the doctor is gonna torture this body with Jim's brain, right? Uh, maybe even before he puts the brain in, he's just gonna torture the body. like carve it up uh, and you know, make it feel unimaginable pain, incredible unimaginable pain. Uh, Jim's brain isn't in it yet, but the body can still feel the pain, right? Um, and uh, the doctor will also, at the point of putting Jim's brain in my body that has been tortured, uh, make it so that the body shows no signs of torture and it won't remember the pain, but it will still have gone through excruciating, incredible pain. All I have to do is give back 500 of the thousand dollars I've been paid and the doctor won't torture my body in this way. Would I do it? Would I give the money up to have my body not be tortured? What do you think? I see a head being shook. Yeah, you're not experiencing it. You don't experience it. Sure. Does anybody else think that they would pay the $500 to not have their body be tortured? Anybody? 
Yeah, okay, one, we have one brave soul. Oh, there's, oh no, that's me online. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Bernard Williams thinks that there are people who, who share the intuition that, yeah, maybe you would pay some money so that your body won't get tortured. Even if your mind isn't in it, you still kind of feel connected. You feel like, well, that sounds awful. I wouldn't want this body to be mangled and put through excruciating pain because it's mine and I feel connected to it. Um, this is a, a thought experiment that's in philosophy, it's called an intuition pump which we'll be doing a lot of today as we like get into the actual lecture. So an intuition pump is a thought experiment where you, you tell a story, right? And what the story is supposed to do is present you with your intuitions. It's not meant to be an argument in itself. Um, usually there's some new, what's called experimental philosophy, XFI, where uh, philosophers will put together questionnaires or do these uh, intuition pumping thought experiments uh, and if you know like enough people have some intuition about something then they can say well we're morally inclined to think this or that is typically typically how it goes they'll show like they'll do some case about uh, a moral decision uh and then you know based on how people typically think they draw some um sweeping empirical claim about intuitions it's it's an interesting field um it's one that's done mostly in moral psychology Anyways, um, an intuition pump is just a, a story that you tell that's supposed to like get your intuition going. Like, what, what do you really think? It's not meant to prove one thing or another. Uh, and so the intuition pump in this body swap torture case that Bernard Williams uh, tells us is to sort of pump your intuition. Well, maybe I do kind of care about my body getting tortured. Now, another one, I think this one is, this is more of an argument that's more convincing at least, is um, Bernard Williams says, look, uh, you're not just your mind, you're not just your memories, you're not just your psychology, you're also very much the way that you are embodied in the world, the way that you express yourself physically, the micro movements of your face, the, like my eyebrows are very expressive, they, they like move up and down in, in conversation quite a bit, and um, they, they speak very much for themselves. Um, and if I were in, if my brain were in, in Jim's body, I wouldn't have the same face. My, my muscles wouldn't move just right. I wouldn't communicate in the same sort of way uh, that my embodied experience communicates as like this body and this brain. So if a huge portion, a, a, an essential portion of what it is that we are is uh, our, our embodied experience, the way that we're physically present in the world, how we move our bodies, how we communicate with them, how we engage with the world, specifically with the, the uh, minutia of what and what we consist of physically, materially, um, then to have your mind swapped into another body is to um, uh, lose a, a really important and large feature of yourself to have to relearn all this and then to change very substantially uh, to maybe not even be identical with or similar to the person that you were before. Uh, so, so here we have a foil contrast. We have a bodily criterion or a, a bodily continuity criterion for personal identity from Bernard Williams. And on the other hand, we have a psychological continuity criterion from uh, Locke through memory. Right? And these are to be contrasted with one another. Now there's all sorts of other really interesting criteria for personal identity uh, in the literature that we won't go into, that this is like a survey class, right? We're just sort of, the, the goal is to get you guys stoked on philosophy. So I'm sharing all like my favorite papers and problems and, and uh, uh, questions. Um, so we won't have time to really dig in, but other, uh, criteria that are out there is that people are four-dimensional space worms. This one's really popular. Um, just to say that you're not just uh, what you are at any given moment or uh, any other given moment and how those two moments are continuous, but um, rather what you are is an entire like temporal thing. So the Mona Lisa uh, is, um, is, is each brushstroke is not the Mona Lisa, but the whole picture as it's painted uh, and completed and living through time, like its entire existence. If we could zoom out on history and see the Mona Lisa or any of us uh, as existing and not existing uh, in that zoomed out holistic view of history, then that is what you are. Um, there's other views that are fun, kind of like the, you are the story that you tell about yourself or that alternatively is told about you. Um, so lots of fun stuff about what identity is. What we're gonna talk about for the rest of the lecture today is 
uh, what identity isn't and why we should think that there is no such thing as self. Okay, so kind of fun, um, which we get through uh, Hume and Parfit as well. But before we do that, we're gonna, as I promised, we're gonna play a game. We're gonna do some intuition pumps. We're gonna see what you think. So I'm gonna run through a bunch of cases that are really strange, like really peculiar science fiction. Um, again, don't give philosophers any age grants. Um, and uh, we're gonna try to look for the I, right? And uh, who or what is that? What is the I that I refer to? And I say that I'm teaching right now. I, I referred to something I, like uh, there's a bottle or there's me. What is the me or the I that I'm referring to, the referent of my uh, uh, pointing my demonstrative point? Um, what is that thing? Like the bottle is right there. I could define it as the encapsulated cylindrical tube that holds water that I drink from. But it's a little more challenging when I want to point to an I and may in fact be impossible. But that's the point of the game. Uh, you win when you find out what your intuitions are about identity. So if you don't find out what your intuitions are about identity, if you leave confused, that may also be a win, but uh, we'll just say that the win condition for now is uh, saying, hmm, I kind of think that, or hmm, I don't think that. So our first example, uh, a body swap case, but similar, different from uh, me in the gym case. Uh, this is Locke's example. So Locke says, hey, uh, 1950s neoliberal boomer man, um, you have a brain. What if that brain was moved dramatically? Did you see that? Very dramatically into the head of this parrot. And now the parrot is uh, telling us all sorts of things about trickle down economics and why we need to buy a life insurance policy, right? Um, what do you think? Is the parrot neoliberal boomer man? Has, has the, the, the neoliberal boomer man's identity moved to the parrot? Who, who says yes? Yes, with a colon. Uh, yeah, let's do this because then in class and see our classmates. Uh, I don't need to have my hand up for this whole time, but we're committed now. Part of the experiment, are they all in his bed now? <laughs> okay, raise your hand if yes. Online. Okay, there's one. Okay, I'd say about half. Raise your hand if no. Did everybody raise their hand? You didn't raise your hand. That's cheating. You're not allowed to cheat. Um, good. So if you said yes, then uh, you probably have intuitions trending towards a psychological continuity criterion of personal identity. That the, the I that we refer to has something to do with the brain or the mind. Um, and as long as that brain or mind could persist in the head of a parrot or in a computer or wherever else, uh, then that's enough. That you know, like, uh, one day I woke up and I was a parrot or you know, today I woke up and I had eight legs and my family threw me in the closet and got an apple stuck in my head. Um, so uh, if you said no, then I wanna hear from you why you said no. So who, who said uh, no neoclassical or neoliberal boomer man is not uh, in the parrot now? Talking about identity, is it just what's represented as classical neoliberal boomer man? Or is it His eye, what, what's the self? Do you think that he's in the parrot now, or that he is the parrot now? His consciousness is still worse represented as identity. Okay, so his consciousness is, but what's represented as his identity is not. Which your answer implies to me that you think that there's something besides just consciousness that identity consists in, because there's a feature that's missing. Yeah, um, I mean, it'd be, it'd be all of it, right? Oh, hey, 
Yeah. Meanwhile, you call State Farm and you hear Polly want a cracker. Right. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. So the whole of him. So there's something more than just consciousness to this person that that matters to to his identity. Um, anybody else who said no? Online too. Anybody online? No. Who else said no? And I said yes, sort of, but I'll answer it for you. Okay. Yes, sort of. Um, I said yes because I, mean, I think it's still him, but his identity has changed. But I said yes because even if his brain stayed in his own head, his identity would still change. So in either case, his identity is going to change over time. Good. In this case, maybe it changed more, but it's not fundamentally different. Good. So the, the idea here is that uh, in either case, whether the brain stays in the, the head of neoliberal, neoliberal boomer man, I should have named him something easier to say. Um, yeah, that guy, but just for online so that you can see. I, this guy has his portrait up, I think, because he like like some endowment or something. And he, he's important to the department, so I don't want to say anything too bad. But but he is so imposing and intimidating, right? Just like intense, right? Like that guy is judging me. Yeah. Anyways, um, what's he judging? Let's find out. What's identity? Um, so the idea here is that either the brain stays in the head or it goes into the head of the parent. In either case, there's been some sort of change. So we don't have identity. If identity is, is to be defined in terms of uh, uh, like strict logical numeric identity, then of course not, right? So uh, sometimes this is called Leibniz's law. Uh, X is equal to Y if and only if all of the properties are X, of X are also all of the properties of Y. Uh, Leibniz invented calculus and built bridges and was a librarian and a super cool guy that wore a beautiful, luscious wig. Amazing. Such a cool philosopher. Um, and he gives us a principle for identity. So if what we're looking for in the eye of identity is something numeric, something unchanging, something static, uh, we're not going to find it in uh, either everyday life, the sort of like folk understanding of identity, uh, which would be the brain staying in the head, because from moment to moment, there are all sorts of changes, right? That nobody is ever the same. You never step in the same river twice is the misquote of Heraclitus. <clears throat> um, if you never step in the same river twice, everything is chaos, everything is changed, then there's no such thing as numeric identity, except if you could like pause time and say, ah, oh, this object is still this object, right? Um, but without that sort of superpower, you would never have a numeric kind of identity. So in other case, if there's change, that's not enough. Now, when we talk about the I or the self, you, you could still say that there is something of that unchanging, uh, unflappable sort that's in a, say, like a soul or, uh, uh, I, I don't know, your spirit energy, whatever, right? Um, but even that, if it's unchanging and everything that, that we are as we interact with the world and live in it does change, right? We grow up, we live every day, we wake up the next day, we learn new stuff, we forget other stuff, right? Um, that sort of thing that doesn't change doesn't really correspond to the folk conception of what we call the eye, right? The, the eye that, that I refer to is one that grows and changes and lives and, uh, you know, live, laugh, love or you pray love, whatever it is. Um, I do those things and those are different all the time. Um, so, so, but this is a really good distinction to make that uh, we should be careful when we're talking about the eye of the self having an identity and the identity consist, uh, being persistent through time that we're gonna have trouble picking out numeric identity unless we do this four dimensional worm thing and say, well, the through time thing is one object and you have to zoom out. You know? um, but it, it, we're right at this point, I suppose, looking for folk conceptions. Um, so keep that in mind. So some examples in pop culture of, hello, this, Freaky Friday. Who's who? Do, 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 
we've seen these movies. Do you have the same intuition about these movies? Do you, do you think that, is Jennifer Aniston? No, it's Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan. Do you think that Lindsay Lohan becomes Jamie Lee Curtis? Like, it, is Jamie Lee Curtis or Lindsay Lohan? Yes. Yeah, so if we share the right intuitions, the same intuitions, then good. But this is, you know, um, this is Hollywood plagiarizing Locke. So uh, now let's look at, uh, let's get more complicated, right? Let's, let, let, we have pretty clear intuitions or mostly give or take with simple body swap, brain in someone else's head or parrot's head. Um, Wiggins, uh, interesting philosopher, cognitive scientist, uh, does a lot of work on split brain cases, which is another really interesting thing that you learn about in a personal identity class, um, where you snip the corpus callosum, the muscle that connects the two lobes of the brain together, and then you get all sorts of weird, freaky stuff that happens, but only in experimental conditions. In normal everyday life, the only strange thing that happens is the left hand will reach for a green uh, shirt and the right hand will slap it away and say, no, I want this blue one, right? Because the, the, you get some weird stuff in everyday life like that, but you can like isolate it in experimental conditions. It's strange. Anyways, the duplication or fission case of the mind is a, a thought experiment derivative of uh, these scientific procedures. And you don't do this because you're trying to like watch a hand slap the other way. That would be evil and not good, but you, you snip the corpus callosum to treat really severe epilepsy. I'm not even sure if it's done anymore. Might still be. I think there are other treatments that are more effective. I, I'm not certain, but this was like a big thing in the 60s and 70s. Anyways, duplication or fission. So here we have uh, A, call him Andy, at T1, say it like noon. And we take Andy's brain and we slice it in half, right down the middle. And then we take two husks, two, two bodies, uh, you know, use your science, science fiction imagination, bodies floating in green vats of goo, and you press a button and whoosh, the goo, you know, falls out with these bodies. And now you have bodies ready for each half of Andy's brain. Each half of Andy's brain is identical and each half functions in exactly the same way as the entire brain does uh, in Andy. So basically what you've done is you've taken the brain You've split it in two, and, and each half works just like it, a whole brain, and you've put them in two husk bodies. And here you have B and C. Uh, so Andy is now at, from noon, now at 2 p.m. He's now B and C. So what should we say about this case? Some options. We could say that Andy is neither B nor C, we could say that Andy is B, but not C, or alternatively, Andy is C, but not B. Right? Or Andy is both still B and C. What do we think? Um, I, I turn out He's both B and C. Okay, anybody else? Intuitions? What do we think? Yeah. Yeah, the, the old body dies or something. Like two separated bodies that yeah, yeah, like the, the they're like new husk bodies that we could even say they, they're like identical to Andy's body. Uh, like, you know, clone two clones of Andy without a brain. And so we just take Andy's brain, slice it in half. Each one works like an actual functional complete full brain and then put them in each of the bodies. So they wake up and they say, hey, I'm Andy. Right? So yeah, I had eggs and toast for breakfast and I went to Memorial High School. Oh, so did I, right? My first girlfriend was Sarah Jones. Oh, so was mine, <laughs> right? Um, so which one is Andy? Is Andy both? Is Andy neither? How about online? Tanner says yes. Okay. It's not terribly illuminating. 
<laughs> yeah, it might, yeah, it might have been an old yes. Yeah. Uh, Alyssa says both B and C. Kyla says neither. There's three options. Oh, neither. Okay. All right. Yeah. You're right. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thinks one. Then. All right. So if we say A, how could a double success be a failure, right? So uh, the brain has been sliced in half, put in these two clones, and they both wake up saying it simultaneously, hey, I'm Andy, right? Kind of weird and freaky that they did it at the same time, but same brain. Um, so the experiment, the procedure is a success, but it failed. Andy isn't either of them. That seems contrary to the whole purpose of what we were doing, right? That insofar as we split the brain and put them in two people, we're trying to create Andy twice and we did, but it's neither, right? Sort of peculiar contra or contradiction of intuitions. Similarly, option two, uh, the, both iterations of it uh, seems arbitrary. Why would Andy be one, but not the other? Both of them have everything mentally, physically that uh, neurologically that the other has. There's no distinguishing them uh, in material fact. So why should we do it, you know, like conceptually? We, we have no texture upon which to make such a distinction. It's arbitrary. And if we say that Andy is both B and C, then we break our notion or idea of identity, at least our folk notion of identity. Identity is supposed to be X equals Y, right? There's one is equal to one is equal to one, right? Um, it's not equal to one and two. So it can't be equal to two things. It can only be equal to itself. So one thing can't be equal to two things. Identity is a one-to-one -one relation, right? So this is sort of a confounding case. So what should we say about it? Some other possibilities. Uh, it could be one person with a divided mind. Uh, there were always two people that were spatially coincident at noon at time one, and then now they're spatially disjoint. So Andy was really uh, Andy, 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 and Andy, Andy, and Andy. Um, and uh, we just didn't know until we split Andy's brain in half and gave them their own individual lives. Uh, and it was sort of just like two people layered on top of each other until we did it, um, until we split them. But both of these options seem implausible, right? What's to say that in at time one, Andy is two Andys, uh, or that uh, there's a division of mind in the at time two because they both operate and look and, and seem to think and act exactly the same way. So the answer that Parfit is going to favor, and this is sort of like as a teaser for the end of our lecture, is that it just isn't clear what we should think or what we should say about these cases. Um, and if we think we must answer the question of identity to say something important, it, it just we, we can't. It, when we are pressed with challenging cases like the, the fission case, uh, our intuitions can't help us. Uh, and we are trapped in a host, a sea of unsatisfactory answers. And so what Parfit's gonna do is rethink the problem uh, and rethink what identity should be uh, sort of entirely. So there's some questions about personal identity for which there are no answers, says Parfit, and we'll come back to this. Um, another, before I move on, this is kind of a fun one that isn't in the, let me make sure I get it on, this is like, Okay, so um, this isn't in the slides, but it is a fun one. So let's say we have uh, Andy and uh, Buddy Jim, right? And we have a, can you see that? Okay, online, everybody? Can you? Yes, no, maybe? Hello, can you read the board? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. So Andy and Jim, and we have the transmogrification machine. And what this transmogrification machine does is it takes one atom from point one and trades it for an atom at point two. So at, uh, we'll say, uh, T0, uh, so we'll say 
at time zero. Uh, Andy is here and Jim is here. Uh, and at time two, uh, they're 50-50. So half of Jim's atoms are now in Andy and half of Andy's atoms are now in Jim. It's, it's a freak show. Ripley's believe it or not, would not believe it, right? Um, who's who? Are either of them still either of them? Do either of them exist at this point? All of their atoms and stuff are still around, but they're completely like mixed. Okay, so what if we shift time two from the 50% point where things are really weird, totally strange, um, to uh, like here and here, where just a couple of atoms have been swapped, you know, four or five. Atoms are really small, but really small. I can't even see them. I mean, like you can sort of see them, but not really, right? So if we switch time zero over there, does Andy still exist? Or is it still the weird, horrific Cronenberg monster that exists in, in the middle point? What do we think? Do, do Andy and, and I, Jim, is that his name, still exist at, at the really early point when just like four or five atoms have been swapped? Yeah, no? How about yes? How about no? Okay. Uh, Somebody from the yes camp. Why do they still exist? Because we swap atoms all the time. Yeah, it's a very, yeah, uh, materially egalitarian world, just sharing our atoms all over the place. Um, but would you have said yes at this point as well? No. So what's the difference then? Because well, we swap atoms all the time. Just little bits. Yeah. Okay, so uh, come back to that. Someone who said no online or not? Nobody online? How about the person? Somebody said no. Uh, I give the same answer pretty much I did before that their identities would have changed anyway. So. Okay, somebody else who said no. <laughs> <laughs> who said no? Oh, now you're hiding. <laughs> okay. Um, well, then we'll come back to the yes answer. So uh, yes, Andy and Jim still exist when T2 is really close, just four atoms deep. What about when it's five atoms deep? I used to find that. What about when it's that far, a quarter? No. Then how about an eighth? Unfortunately, okay. for them. Oh, wait, are they still conscious at T equals two? Oh, yeah, what's going on? Here? Yes. Oh. Uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> so are they still aware that they're? Yes. Oh, then, they're, still they're aware the whole time, unfortunately. If we take away one atom from me, am I still, am I still me? Holy? You tell me. Are you still you holy if we like pluck away an atom? Seems so, right? Uh, Locke would certainly say so. You lose your hand or your arm. You're still the same person. We read this last week. Um, Hume is going to agree that, yeah, you know, whatever I call I, if I lose some, like my pinky finger or whatever, like I've lost a constitutional physical part of myself, but it's still me. But then this weird, freaky case here is it, strange, does not seem to be me. But then there I show up on the other end as soon as T0 switched all the way to 100%, um, just sort of like traded spaces. So how much could you lose of yourself? That's the question. How much could you lose of yourself? Do we have the capacity, the power to reasonably answer that question? So if we think no in the middle, but we think yes somewhere very close to the beginning, what principled way could we answer this question? Where, where could we say the, the, uh, the 
pile of grains or the, the number of grains becomes a heap of them. It's a vagueness kind of problem, right? And the vagueness of, of identity is an issue. It, it, what, it, what it does is it, it, it means that identity is at least appears to be, this is an argument for identity not being some physical empirical thing that we can like measure and, and see out in space, some actual like entity that uh, exists uh, for sure at any specific point, that it, identity is vague and that it has fuzzy boundaries and that we're, we don't have the capacity to, to, with principle, say where it ends and where it begins. That's what this argument shows. And this is one of Parfit's big arguments for his conclusion uh, of what, what identity is or how we should think about identity, which we won't do until the end of class. Question? Not looking into your terms of atoms that you saw, if you're looking into terms of like Jordan relation, like if a person has gotten like two or three organ donations, it would be themselves, like we, we don't identify them as like a different person, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, so this is, uh, and you don't identify the person who like gave up their, who donated their kidney as someone else just because they've lost the kidney, they're still living on well. Um, exactly. So, so in the case of like receiving organs or even giving them the physical non-necessity to your identity seems pretty potent there that, that yeah, there's a pretty good case to be made for um, physical changes occurring, but still the identity sticking around. But you trade it out enough of your body parts and you start to not really seem yourself anymore, right? If we swapped arms, just right arms, would you, I mean, would you still consider me to be me, even though clearly my arm is different than yours? Would I consider you to be you, even though you, you had my right arm? Yeah, I don't know what I think about personal identity. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, another really fun one that sort of deals with this is the ship at Theseus. I'm sure you've heard this example before. Theseus has a boat and you take away a board of it and you replace it with a, an exactly identical board. Does he have the same boat? Well, yeah. And then over the course of the decade or two that uh, Theseus and Jason and the Arnold, whatever, like sailing around uh, the Mycenaean Mediterranean uh, slaying boars and medusas and all that. Uh, every board of the ship is replaced with an exactly identical board. So none of the original boards are on the ship. In fact, none of the original material parts of the, the boat are uh, a part of it anymore. Um, but it looks exactly as it did. Like you took the picture uh, when the boat set sail and then when it returns to harbor, uh, they are exactly identical, but it has entirely new wood in the second picture. Is it the same boat? No? Why not? I said yeah. Oh, yeah. Why is it the same boat? I, don't know. I think what I was thinking is our salt. Like we replace our salt every like, seven years. Yeah. It's the same person. You know, like our cells are always changing down and growing. We replace ourselves every seven years. Our, our cells reduplicate, recreate themselves over the course of average seven years. All of the cells in your body will have died away, been excreted, and then repopulated themselves. Um, we are ships of Theseus, and we think of ourselves as persisting through time. Uh, so why shouldn't we think of the ship of Theseus as persisting through time? This is called an argument by, argument by analogy. It's a good one. Um, anybody think, no, it's not the same ship? Let's see, Kyla says, I think of a person, someone is functioning computer with parts. This is called functionalism, uh, computational functionalism specifically. Take a mind language and reality philosophy of mind class and you'll cover this quite uh, thoroughly. Um, if you take away part, you still have the overall concept that's still computer. So, so the idea of computational functionalism, theory of mind, is that mind is sort of like an algorithm or a software. <clears throat> um, and it doesn't matter how the software is actualized. So whether it's run .exe in a Windows computer or .dmg in a, on the Mac, uh, what matters is that it produces the same GUI, the same like graphics user interface, the same like program. So like Chrome on a Mac and Chrome on a Windows computer look exactly the same, right? That's what the mind is. It doesn't matter like 
the specific uh, way that the the uh, programming is written. What matters is that you have the same like end product. So Kyla thinks that the mind or the self is something like this. That's good. It's called functionalism. Um, no, it isn't the same boat, says uh, Alyssa. It's been replicated from new parts. Yeah. So you might think that the boat has the same story or the boat uh, uh, has some sort of persistent property like in qualitative identity that matters. Uh, and so it is the same boat. You might think, nope, it lost all of its uh, physical parts. And so it's not the same boat. This would be a physical continuity intuition of identity, right? So we're starting to see a whole lot of pressure from a lot of different directions about what we think identity is, where our intuitions go, and how we can hold many different intuitions about many different kinds of identity sort of all at once, even though they seem contradictory. And a lot of it is going to have to do with this vagueness problem, that identity is fuzzy. So let's do one more. Hello. One more game. This is the teleportation one. So if you watched the Parfit video, you should recognize um, this the Star Trek teleportation device was, um, well, philosophically more interesting than the show led on. So here we have T1 and T2 and uh, teleportation with a little one next to it. We're gonna go through a few iterations of the case. We're gonna change it around a little bit. So this is just the first iteration of the teleportation case. Uh, so notice I chose a very, um, uh, welcoming picture of the earth. It's both flat and round. There you go. You're allowed to believe what you want. But let's learn about teleportation and identity. Um, I'm a philosopher. I don't know anything about physical science. Um, so you run into an advertisement. You're walking downtown and it says, we have a great new technology to send you to Mars instantly for $30, a low, low price. You can hop in our antimatter quantum, quantum recombobulator and begin the space adventure of your dreams. You can move from your either flat or round Earth to uh, what appears to be a flat Mars uh, with a very funky dancing alien. Super cool, great. Uh, you could go dance with that alien too for the low, low price. So our friend Peggy here, uh, I think she's in a wheelchair, wheels into the antimatter quantum recombobulator. I choose very hard to say names for these examples. Um, and is teleported over to time two. <laughs> Makes a cool noise. And how this thing works is it deletes Peggy, right? So what our teleportation device does is it scans Peggy's body and her wheelchair conveniently. Um, it takes a uh, exact image of every single atom in every single position that it's in of her entire body and then deletes it. Goodbye, no more Peggy, Peggy gone, she's dead. Uh, or is she? Because there she appears on Mars at time two. So Peggy has been deleted from earth and reconstructed on Mars using Martian atoms, uh, but in exactly the same constitution. So uh, there's a, a physical identity between Peggy on Earth, or what was Peggy on Earth, and what is now Peggy on Mars. Is Peggy the same at T2 as she was at T1? Is it the same Peggy? Is this Peggy, is this still Peggy? Yes, it's still Peggy. Online. Yes, it's still Peggy. Okay, no, it's not Peggy. No, Pe Peggy died on Earth. Then who is that? That was a lot of you saying, no, who, who is that? You ask her her name, what, what did she say? Yeah, yeah. You ask her her social security number? She'll say, get lost. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this is how Star Trek teleportation is supposed to work. I don't think they ever tell us that, but you can presume because they just disappear somewhere <clears throat> and are recombobulated. So I think the the general intuition that it is still Peggy, because there she is wheeling around, having a great time dancing with her funky 
alien friend. So let's change the case. So in this case, the machine is going to fail, right? Uh, so I have animations, but I don't ever know where they are. There, yeah. Ooh. Okay. Oh, I, I forgot to explain a very important part. Why that's the animation it is. Okay. So the machine fails, and it duplicates Peggy on Mars, but the the zapper delete array in the quantum recombobulator uh, fails, just fizzles out, right? And Peggy is now still on Earth. So Peggy, realizing that the, the delete array that was right above her head, that the evil death ray that was about to zap her to kingdom come uh, is broken and says, oh my God, get me the hell out of here. I don't want to be zapped if that thing turns back on. So it wheels out real quick. Okay, so now Peggy is out of the, the quantum recombobulator on Earth, but she's been duplicated on Mars. Don't vaporize me, I'm a real Peggy, she says loudly in all caps, without an apostrophe. Who's the real Peggy? Earth Peggy is the real Peggy. Anybody think Mars Peggy is the real Peggy? No? You think they're both Peggy? Yeah. You have to have them fight to the death to decide who gets to continue to be Peggy. <laughs> yeah, sure. So they begin to live different lives. The moment of uh, separation, we might say that uh, they become uh, entirely unique individual people. Kyla says, that's when the Sims program fails on the alien computers. You have two different versions of the same Sim. Yeah. <laughs> and then everything shuts down. Game over. Okay. So another case, the machine is going to fail again, but this time it really fails. It, it does some damage. Peggy does not appear on Mars and she's vaporized. Oh no. Peggy's dead, right? No more Peggy. Does Peggy exist? In the data, I guess. In the data, yeah. She doesn't show up on the other end until T2 is 40 years later. Peggy's, you know, she's, she's getting up there. She's in her elder years, uh, the, the twilight of her life, the, the autumn of, of her existence. And she appears one day, 40 years later, on Mars in the recombobulator and says, ah, great, I was just on Earth. But her family is gone. Her husband has a new wife. He's, I, he must be like 120 years old. <laughs> it's the future, they live for a long time. Um, they have children, the husband and the new wife. Um, her job and education are now 40 years behind the times. Uh, she's still trying to sell life insurance when Nobody buys that anymore. Uh, she's living in a new world. Her existential orientation of the world has no resemblance to what it once did for her. Think like Futurama, right? Fry waking up in the year 20, 30, whatever year, a thousand years later or whatever, right? Um, Peggy now appears 40 years later. None of what she was, given the way that she fit into the world, fits anymore. All of her family has moved on. They thought she was dead for 40 years, right? Um, she doesn't know how to live in this new strange world, but all of her habits, her hopes and dreams are things of the past, right? Is this still Peggy? Did Peggy just wake up after a long sleep? Did she go from not existing to existing? You ask her who she is, she's still going to say Peggy. Curious case, right? It's tough to say if this is still Peggy, if, if she stopped existing, if she continues to exist, identity is fuzzy. It's really hard to pick out. It's so easy to say, I'm going to go to the store today. So simple. And it's, it, it, there, there's nothing easier than understanding what that sentence means, right? As long as you speak English uh, and you're like at least a kindergartner, you understand what I'm going to go to the store means, right? Um, that to say that is to say like, whatever this thing is, is gonna go to this other location and then I'll return. Um, but when you drill deeper 
into our concept of identity, what, what we're talking about, what the referent of that I is, things start to get really strange. It gets really hard with principle to nail down just what the heck we're talking about when we say something as simple and as basic as I'm gonna go to the store or here I am, or hello, I'm, right? It's tough. So what we got from Locke and uh, later in Bernard Williams and, and in some of our earlier cases too, there's a whole lot of nice explanations for what identity is. Identity is whatever you remember, right? Or identity is the relationship of your mind uh, as it uh, persists through the body that uh, hosts it. Um, that there's probably some sort of relationship between the two and that it's an important relationship to, to share and hold um, for identity. Great. But is that what identity is? Well, as soon as we start to put pressure on these concepts, these criteria for identity, these ideas, we start to run into problems. We run into the fuzziness. We see that things are not as simple as uh, they uh, once appeared to be. And this will bring us to Hume. So for the rest of the lecture, we'll talk about the Hume reading. Uh, so we'll talk about a little bit of background on Hume and his target, which is the idea of personal identity, specifically um, Locke's. Uh, we'll cover a negative thesis about the elimination of self, but, which is, so Hume is a skeptic, uh, and so Hume is going to be very skeptical about what the self is, and um, he's also going to give us some positive views, uh, which are sort of pragmatic views insofar as they're not principled, they're not rational uh, in a, a strict sort of analytic deductive principled or rational way of thinking about uh, a concept. Um, but rather they're useful to us. They're, they're like, when we talk about what self is, this is probably what we mean, um, even if it's not uh, substantiated in uh, fact or evidence or, or reason. Um, it's substantiated in action and use. And then finally we'll close with Parfit, which I teased at the beginning of our lecture. Okay, so David Hume uh, exists, uh, like he's born, seven years, I want to say, something like 10 years after John Locke dies. Um, so in like the next generation of philosophers in uh, England, and he's a Scottish guy. Uh, he's an empiricist and a skeptic, uh, a naturalist, so um, interested in material science and um, uh, reason specifically, and in the uh, uh, development of knowledge from experience, not from intuition or reason, that things don't come to us, we learn them through living in the world. Uh, he writes a bunch, but his two major works are a treatise on human nature and an inquiry concerning human understanding. The section that we read for class today was from a treatise on human nature, um, which eight years later, uh, he writes the inquiry and says, don't read or believe anything I wrote in the treatise. I don't think it anymore. All of my thoughts are now here in the inquiry. So he doesn't deal with personal identity in the inquiry. Uh, he only deals with it in the treatise, but both are totally fascinating, awesome philosophical works, but you should just know sort of uh, offhand that Hume thought that of his work. Um, and as sort of a side note, yeah, I might understand why, because his views in the inquiry are much more concise and complete and frankly awesome. Um, it's a shorter work. Uh, it's really punchy um, and it doesn't veer off into a whole lot of other sort of side fun subjects. It, it stays really um, tight and principled through its entire um, development. Uh, and I think based on what he writes in the inquiry, you could like infer what he might say about something like identity, but that might be why he doesn't treat identity and other issues in the inquiry. Just a guess, I, I'm not a Hume scholar at all. So. Hume's empiricist theory of ideas and reasonings so of perceptions. Um, we have to do a little bit of like philosophy of mind for Hume to understand like where Hume is coming from when he's talking about uh, and arguing for and against the concept of identity. So um, there are thoughts and there are impressions for Hume uh, which have differences in force and vivacity. Um, so thoughts or ideas, they're things like memories, images, beliefs, concepts, and impressions or sensations, emotions, drives, or desires, this sort of thing. So an impression is uh, roughly what you feel and a thought is roughly what you think. It's sort of um, really in a nutshell here. 
but all thoughts and impressions come from experience that you feel by interacting with the world and you think about stuff because you have objects of experience of which you can think because you experience them. So Hume says, but though our thought seems to possess this unbounded liberty, we shall upon a near examination find that it is really confined within narrow limits and that this creative power of the mind amounts to no more than the faculty of compounding, transposing, augmenting, or diminishing the materials afforded us by the senses and experience. When we think of a gold mountain, we only think of two consistent, two consistent ideas, gold and mountain, unicorn, horn, and horse, right, uh, with which we are formally acquainted. So we have uh, thoughts and ideas, and we uh, smush them together to create new thoughts and ideas, but uh, we don't come up with uh, ex nihilo uh, impressions or thoughts. Rather, they come from the world, and then we use our power of imagination to develop those thoughts into something more complex. Um, so Hume's target, uh, his question is, is there a self? I'll call this question S. Is there a referent for the I or self? This is sort of what I've been intimating all lecture so far. And what, if anything, is the subject of our psychological property or what, what is the referent for the I or self um, psychologically? I intend to go to the store, I'm afraid, I want pizza, I believe Jones won, I think it's raining. What is this thing that um, we refer to? Uh, and this question is distinct from Locke's. So Locke's is, what are the criteria for personal identity, right? Locke is trying to say, uh, what is it that makes us persist through time, uh, sort of assuming that there is something to be found? You know, like he's, he's uh, not shooting in the dark, he has a target and is going to develop an argument towards that target, which is there is a thing called personal identity. What is it? Hume is taking a step back and saying, is there such a thing at all that, that we can reason towards? Um, so Hume's answer to this question is going to be negative. Um, there is no self. We have no evidence for the self, says Hume. We cannot know of a self. Um, and both of these claims... Hume makes both of them, and one is stronger than the other. So Hume is going to say there is no self, but he's also going to say that there's no evidence for this self. So he's going to sort of back up, and then it's at the point that he backs up that he gives us his more positive accounts, the like bundle theory of self, which we'll talk about. So what are the criteria for personal identity? Um, Hume denies that we're in a position to answer this question, the question that inspires Locke, uh, because uh, there is no self, or at least there's no empirical evidence. We can't search out in the world, in our thoughts, or in our impressions for a self. And if there's no empirical evidence, then uh, we can't uh, say that there's criteria for something of which there's no evidence for. Uh, this does eventually get him into some trouble with the religious community, um, as you might imagine with soul stuff. Fun historical note. So the negative thesis, how does Hume come to the conclusion that there is no self? Well, Hume's idea of identity is the invariableness and uninterruptedness of any object through a supposed variation in time. So we see a sort of like X equals Y definition, but we should note that um, uh, Hume's emphasis seems to be a qualitative identity rather than a numeric one. What he's talking about is uh, the quality of what it, it's like to exist, the, the, the invariableness, the lack of changing in features. Um, and uh, this is what we're worried about with identity. So if this is what must be satisfied um, for a person or any object to persist across time is to be invariant and uninterrupted uh, through time, uh, then no persons persist as identical states. Right? We all change. Oh yeah, sorry. I don't find my mouse up there. Okay, so um, people change all the time, right? That uh, from one moment to the next, we'll have lost a few atoms, we'll have traded a few atoms, we'll have moved things around here and there, uh, we'll learn new stuff, we have new experiences, new thoughts, et cetera. Um, we fall asleep, so we interrupt. Uh, so the person varies through experiencing the world and is also interrupted by just the way that we live. So. Uh, there should be no persons who satisfy this criteria for identity as Hume 
uh, conceives of it. So if we do continue to attribute identity to objects at different times, then we only do so in an improper sense. So if our principle of uh, identity is this first line, and it's empirically true that everything always changes, nothing satisfies that. However, we still use claims of identity. We say like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. I used to do this, I still do too, right? Um, but uh, in that second case, if we're still using identity, recognizing the like principle of identity and the inability of objects to satisfy it because they're always changing, then when we use attributions of identity, when we refer to identical objects, uh, we're doing it incorrectly. And there's two different ways we could do it incorrectly. We might uh, have an epistemic justificatory account or a causal genetic account. We might say, uh, look, I, I um, think I, I construct in my mind, I can imagine myself as what I was using my memory, um, or uh, like this is how I got there, that the one thing uh, continues to persist as a coherent object. So there's some sort of causal material structure. So these are just sort of like fancier words for physical and psychological continuity. Make it simpler. So what evidence do we have for the self, right? So. Identity can't exist in principle, but let's continue to investigate, says Hume. What, what evidence might we have for the self? If any impression gives rise to the idea of self, that impression must continue invariably the same through the whole course of our lives since self is supposed to exist after that manner. But there's no impression constant and invariable. Pain and pleasure, grief and joy, passions and sensations succeed one another and never all exist at the same time. It cannot therefore be from any of these impressions or uh, any other that the idea of self is derived and consequently there's no such idea. Um, so what Hume is saying here is, is look, uh, what we would need for empirical evidence of identity of self is some impression of an I, some impression that persists because that's what we want, right? We want um, an invariable and uninterrupted uh, quality to an object uh, through time. But all of my impressions are always changing. Like right now I see blue, and right now I see white, and right now I see the inside of my eyelids, right? So my impressions are always changing. There's no one impression that is always present, says Hume. Um, we're always experiencing the moment of the world individually from every other moment of the world. Every snapshot is its own snapshot. But what about introspection? What if I look inwards? What if I'm not looking outwards towards the world, but inwards into myself, not, not just about my impressions empirically and my experience of the world, but inwardly towards my thoughts? For my part, whenever I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other of heat or cold. I'm hot. I'm cold. Light or shade, it's too bright. It's too dark. Love or hatred, pain or pleasure, ow, right? I never catch myself at any time without a perception and never observe anything but the perception. Super famous quote. And I, I love this passage. It's poetic, it's beautiful, it's short, it's to the point. And what he's saying is like, look, when I look inwardly, inwardly and I look for myself, all I ever find are my impressions. All I ever find are what I'm feeling uh, or what I'm experiencing. But I never find an impression of an I. There's never an individual distinct uh, uh, impression of the the I, the I that I refer to, my identity, whatever I'm supposed to be, separate from the impressions that I have of the world of my experience being. So let's do some experimental philosophy. Uh, what persists while I sleep or during gaps in consciousness? Well, it says Hume, when, I, when my perceptions are removed for any time as by sound sleep, so long as I'm insensible of myself, and may truly be said not to exist. So he was going to say, look, if you're asleep, you don't exist. But what destroys me? Well, and we were all perceptions removed by death, and could I never think, nor feel, nor see, nor love, nor hate, after the dissolution of my body, I should be entirely annihilated. Nor do, nor do I conceive what is farther requisite to make me a perfect non-entity. So the, the idea here is to say, look, um, what destroys me? Well, the complete dissolution of the apparatus that uh, constructs your impressions, your experience of the world through which they flow. And if that apparatus is annihilated, goes away, what could you say is you? There's all, all that there is in you is some apparatus that has a fluid form of uh, representing 
experiencing. Um, and if that apparatus goes, then there's nothing left. Um, and Hume says, I cannot conceive what is farther requisite to make me a perfect non-entity, which I think is a jab towards like souls, right? That um, if we continue to exist after the annihilation of like our bodies that empirically experience the world that give us impressions of it, um, and whatever that soul is, is not the thing that we are now. And so I can't conceive of what it might be like to be without all of this impression stuff. Cause all I know when I look inwards or when I look outwards is what I'm experiencing and what I have experienced. So the bottom line is just that we have no evidence for a substantial self. We have no evidence for uh, an uninterrupted and invariable object that persists through time. And if we lack evidence from experience, given that he's an empiricist, right? If we lack empirical evidence for some thesis, then we lack any good reason to commit to that thesis. We can't commit to a thesis for which there's no empirical evidence as an empiricist. Now, if you're a Descartes and a rationalist, you might say, well, there's like some sort of intuition, there's like, you know, ideas bolted into your brain from God or whatever, right? And those are enough. Um, but if they do not, for the, the strict empiricist, if the uh, object does not exist in the world, if there's no empirical evidence, then there's no evidence for that thesis. And Hume's epistemic commitments, his uh, commitments for, like to, to like knowing whether or not there's a self, as an empiricist constrains metaphysics. So he's committed to being an empiricist, right? Which limits him from uh, admitting of a thesis, uh, an identity um, that, that has no empirical evidence. If there's not an empirical uh, uh, relata for the object of inquiry, then there's no point talking about it, says the strict empiricist, says Hume. And Hume takes a similar stand with respect to knowledge of the external world, to induction and to causation. Uh, if you took an epistemology class, uh, my epistemology class, we would cover these problems. So Hume's gonna show us that induction and scientific reasoning is uh, irrational. It's cool stuff and it's totally like sound argument. So we can have two interpretations of Hume's negative account. He says, look, there's no evidence for self. All I ever see are my impressions. I don't have an impression of myself at any time. There's just the feelings that uh, I have of my experience at any given moment. So we can be a limitivists. We can say just there is no self. We take, uh, because we, we can be the super hardcore empiricists. We can um, be a, a really strict hard line uh, interpreter of uh, the no evidence uh, human, human arguments and say, well, okay, there's no self. But we could also be agnostic. The agnostic interpretation is consistent with what Hume has told us about there being no evidence for self so far. Um, just because we have no evidence for a self doesn't mean that there is no self, right? The, 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 the evidence to the contrary uh, just doesn't exist. So we can't know of a self, whatever we have is not enough to give us what would be needed to, to, to uh, be evidence for a substantial form of identity. And if we take on an agnostic perspective of Hume, rather than this hard line, uh, there is no self view, then uh, we could be a little more charitable to Hume's positive account. So Hume is gonna say, look, there's no evidence for self, but we still use it. So what, what do we mean when, when we say I or use the self? Um, and this can be made consistent for Hume overall in the project by being uh, agnostic about the evidence for self, that maybe self is really something to do with what Hume is talking about here. So common sense observation. But we each do have a sense and an idea of the self. I'm going to go to the store. I, I feel sad. I feel happy. I of myself, you of yourself, and so on. And moreover, we can each identify objects as the same objects across time. Here's a cup of coffee. There it still is, right? And now it's back there again. Same cup of coffee. Um, how could we all do this so well and so consistently um, if Hume is right? And it, it, if Hume is systematically mistaken, what, wouldn't that say like, well, there's no evidence for self, but we all say that I'm there and we're all pretty accurate and at least saying that's the same cup of coffee would all agree, common sense. So he maintains that we are epistemically unjustified in our idea of self and our attributions of identity, but that we each have these ideas and in some sense must have them. We can't help but to think that there's a self. 
So Hume gives us both an epistemic justificatory account and a causal genetic account. He denies that we have good reason for our attributions of identity, but also provides an explanation of the underlying causal psychological mechanism. So he's going to say like, look, um, we don't have evidence. We can't know of a self, the epistemic justificatory account, but there's also a form of self that we use in everyday life. And this is the self-understood causally genetic, the, the, the psychological uh, uh, use of the word self in our everyday lives, what that means something to us. Um, and this is an alternative account, okay? So the mistake. If identity requires one invariable and uninterrupted object, then there's nothing in experience, including in introspection, so like looking inwards and then reconstructing features of experience through our thoughts and imagination that provides evidence for a self. Our eyes cannot turn in their sockets without varying our perceptions. Our thought is still more variable than our sight and all of our senses and faculties contribute to this change. Again, no evidence for self. We do no less have an idea of self. Uh, so once Hume has made the above denial, he turns to a positive explanation for what this idea is and how it's used. And here we get Hume's bundle theory of mind. Here's what in denying or at least remaining agnostic about identity, we are still able, according to Hume, able to in principle claim about what identity counts as. When I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I stumble on some particular perception or other heat or cold, light or shade, hatred, pain or pleasure, never catch myself. But here's what we are. Nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions which succeed one another with an inconceivable rapidity and are in a perpetual flux and movement. I don't know if I have the theater quote. Yeah, good. So what we get in a bundle theory is, is that there's no impression of identity, but there's something that holds together all of our other impressions about everything else. And we seem to feel very strongly about the fact that there are so many impressions consistently held together uh, through time that even though they're always changing, uh, they feel really close and the closeness of them and their propensity and massiveness um, amount to what we might use or consider to be a self. And there's a constant moving through, but there's a consistency to the object that holds the moving through the change. So we have an analogy to a theater. The mind is a kind of theater where several perceptions successively make their appearance, pass, repass, glide away, and mingle in an infinite variety of postures and situations. Another beautiful passage. So what we get with the theater analogy is, is that the, the self is something through which there's always change, but the play is kind of there, right? That the actors move around, but it's always the same play. And we have no reason to like, so you go to the theater and uh, you ask your, your theater friend uh, where the play is and they'll point at the stage and you say, that's the stage, where's the play? And they'll point at the actors and say, those are the actors, where's the play? And they'll point at, say like the action, and you say, well, that's the action, where's the play? And they might point everywhere and never be able to do it. Um, the university, you go on a tour, you say, where's the university? Well, say, this is the humanities building. And where is the university? This is the sports field, where's the university? This is the parking lot, where's the university, right? You'd never point to the university itself, but the university is, is like this, bundle or this concept that we extrapolate from the um, changing objects within it. It's a wrapper. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also everything that's in the wrapper. It's not like, so that that's, this is more of the wrapper idea is uh, a Buddhist conception of self, uh, granary consciousness. I can't remember the Sanskrit word for it, but the idea is that um, you're sort of like this, like a balloon or a thin layer of latex, right? Um, and there's really no difference between inside and outside, but you're this infinitesimally thin layer. Um, and that's your like karmic body as it moves through the world and to, um, to uh, enlighten is to sort of make the membrane of your latex or your empty granary permeable, metaphorically speaking. Um, for Hume, it's the, the granary is full the wrapper is full of candy and you're the candy too, but the candy is like always changing. You're, you're the play that everybody's moving around in. So there's no prop, there's properly no simplicity in at one time, nor identity in different 
whatever natural propension we may have to imagine that simplicity and identity, that the play is always moving, the action is always changing, uh, there's a lot going on, there's no simplicity, and there's nothing that remains the same. The comparison of the theater must not mislead us. They are the success of perceptions only that constitute the mind, nor have we the most distant notion of the place where these scenes are represented or of the materials in which it is composed. The mind is nothing but a bundle or collection of different perceptions. So what then gives us a great propension to ascribe an identity to this bundle? Well, uh, not from any single impression. No single impression gives you the, the play. No single uh, impression would give you a person. You would just have hot or uh, love or anger, whatever, right? Um, you would not get the person it takes a bundle, right, to make a whole person. There's no impression, constant and variable, pain, pleasure, grief, right? Um, instead, we might imagine what a diverse but related succession of events or thoughts uh, are identical in spite of their being variable and interrupted. So there's a whole lot of thoughts that we have, a whole lot of impressions that we have. They're always changing, they're always shifting, but we use our power of imagination like we do to make a gold mountain. We take impression of gold, impression of mountain. Now we have gold mountain, unicorn, horse, and horn. Um, and we do the same thing with the list of our impressions, our experiences of the world. We bundle them together. We use our imagination to take a leap and we wrap them all together and say, well, that's what I am, that's me. So Hume distinguishes two ideas or concepts. He's gonna distinguish identity from diversity. So identity is an object that remains invariable and uninterrupted. Diversity, on the other hand, is several different objects existing in succession and connected by a close relation or what he's gonna call resemblance. So if there's significant resemblance between perceptions, we confuse diverse objects for identical objects. Right. I'll read this quote. So let's take a break for a second. An example of imagined object identity. You have an acorn and you put it outside your window and you get a whole lot of sunlight. And then a year later you have a sproutling, right? And you say, hey, that's the acorn I planted. Uh, and then 50 years later, you have a whole tree. You have your own microclimate outside the window. You have shade. You're no longer getting blinded in the mornings. And you say, that's the acorn I planted. But it is completely changed in every way. You're not looking at a little acorn anymore. You're looking at a big, giant, 51-year-old tree, right? Um, and there's no principled way, according to him, there's no empirical evidence for us to say that the acorn is the tree because the acorn is something constitutionally completely distinct from what the tree has become. Every part of the tree is different and is always changing and is, it resembles in no way the sproutling or the acorn. However, there is a consistency. There is a follow through of acorn to sproutling to adult mature tree to old growth even that uh, we imagine to be in that particular object. It's not actually there at any point You'd say, I have an impression of acorn. I have an impression of sproutling. I have an impression of tree. I have an impression of old growth. And at every point, these impressions are different from one another. They're interrupted. They're, they're very variable. Uh, but we use our imagination, like when we make a unicorn in our heads, to draw together the um, tree as it grows from acorn to tree to say it's the same thing. So it's a kind of mistaken reason. But it's one that we use all the time, and it's how we use it, says Hume. So Hume's account of our idea of self is just another instance of this psychological phenomenon. It's kind of mistake. It's a useful mistake, but it's, one, it's, it's a mistake. It's identity ascribed to a self or a person is no less a fiction than identity ascribed to objects outside of us. It too is explained by mistaking related entities for identical ones. That the acorn is similar to the sproutling, that the sproutling is similar to the tree, that the tree is similar to old growth. These aren't identity relations, but because they're similar enough, they resemble one another sufficiently that the roots sprouted from the acorn look like the roots of the sproutling, that the trunk of the sproutling looks like the trunk of the mature tree, that if there's sufficient resemblance, then we use our power of imagination to impose a, an illusory notion of identity upon those objects and likewise with ourselves. Tis still true that every distinct perception which enters into the composition of the mind is a distinct existence and is different and distinguishable and separable from every other perception, either contemporary or successive. 
But as notwithstanding this distinction and separability, we suppose the whole train of perceptions to be united by an identity, a question naturally uh, uh, arises concerning the relation of this identity. So what, what is the relation of this? What, what's the, what is this kind of identity? Um, it has to do with memory and imagination. So there is uh, resemblance and there's cause and effect. So say uh, there's a tomato and this woman is looking at the tomato and she blinks and then she looks at the tomato and she blinks and she looks at the tomato and she says, same tomato, right? Somebody could have switched it out with an exactly identical tomato when she blinked. That's absolutely uh, logically possible, right? It is not outside the realm of possibility to have identical tomatoes swapped out, right? But she's blinking, tomato, tomato, tomato. Okay, so that's the same tomato. It looks just the same every time she looks at it, you know, like double take, double take, double take. Um, it's always the same because it's it resembles itself well enough. There, each impression of the tomato is, is distinct. Every impression is, is unique. There's no impression all the way through the tomato and they're interrupted, right? Because she's blinking. So it's varied, it's interrupted, but there's enough resemblance between her double takes or blinks of the tomato to say, okay, well, that's the same one. And we can also imagine going backwards, right? That uh, I um, wake up and I lift my head from my pillow and I look at my pillow and I say, oh, that pillow was there all night, probably. Uh, we have no empirical and principal evidence to say that it was, right? but we, we use our, our imagination to tell a causal story of what we think that pillow must have been doing while we were not conscious of it, while we were not present, experiencing it, gaining evidence of it. And this is what identity is for objects uh, that resemble each other. We uh, can pick them out as uh, individuated. And then we can also extrapolate by the imagination backwards to their persistence right, through time. So given these perceived and imagined resemblances uh, and causes effects that the pillow lying on my bed causes it to, my head on the pillow causes it not to move, right? The mind searches for a unifier. It searches for what makes all of these impressions the same. And so it creates the fiction of the continued self, of the continued identity, the persistence. There's no persistence in our impressions and in our experience, right? There's no evidence for that. But uh, we, lacking it, impose one on those objects. So our experience reveals the resemblance and causal relations between perceptions, and the transition between perceptions is coherent and smooth. So this is Hume's idea of what the self is causally genetically, right? We, we can't know that there's a self. We don't have any principled reason, but uh, through imagination and through uh, causality, which itself is um, for Hume, there's no principled way to know that causal forces operate on one another. It requires inductive scientific reasoning, but we won't get into that. Um, this is what identity is. By our very nature, we imagine that there must be some unifying thing. We make this leap, this mistake, um, and continue to mind ourself and enables or explains this unity and coherence of experience. And the resulting idea of self is no less a fiction and thus epistemically unjustified. There's no principled reason for it, but it's not one that we can or should resist. We have to act as if, as I said, there is a self, as if objects have identities, that they do persist through time, that, um, there's another philosopher that exists in this uh, time period who takes Hume as a foil, Thomas Reed. And what Reed says is, look, Hume, you can deny that the sun will rise every day from the comfort of your armchair while you're writing your philosophy. You can say that there's no self and that uh, causal relations don't uh, deductively hold together. But uh, as soon as you cross the street and you see a bus coming towards you, you're going to get out of the way, right? You're going to make these assumptions. You're going to assume that there's some sort of causal relationship between bus hurtling towards you and imminent doom, right? Uh, the annihilation of the mistake that you think yourself is, that you operate just like everybody else in the actual world for all of your skepticism on paper. But I don't think that Hume would be terribly unhappy with this objection. He wouldn't even take it as much of an objection. The purpose of this kind of skepticism is to help us be careful with our concepts and with our reasoning, to understand where the limitations are, right? To say, look, 
I can't help but to think that I am me, that that is that, and that that and I persist through time in a similar sort of way by resemblance and by the imposition of causality um, uh, in their, their uh, temporal history. I can't help but to live that way, but I recognize with epistemic humility that I don't have any truly principled reasons for thinking this way. I just have to. And what this, the, if Hume is, is uh, hardcore about his thesis, right? There is no self. Um, I think he'll have gone a step too far and it's almost not helpful. Now there's, there's Peronian skepticism, which would want us to like get rid of all knowledge. There's also um, a later Han dynasty period Taoism, which recommends a similar sort of like uh, absconce from mental states and knowledge. But um, for Hume, the form of skepticism is a, is a promotion of a kind of intellectual virtue of epistemic humility that uh, we saw quite a bit in the Apology of Socrates by Plato, right? That I am the wisest man in Athens, not because I know so much, but because I'm the only one who will not claim to know what I do not know. This is epistemic humility. This is not taking control uh, or claiming to have principled reasons for that which you do not, right? And similar here, we can still act and live in the world as if. We can still work with uh, unprincipled suppositions because we have to, but recognizing that they are unprincipled is a kind of sensitivity, not be so dogmatic, right? To not um, hold on with white knuckles to what should be uh, rested softly in the palm, right? Okay. So we'll conclude with Parfit. So what we've seen so far in last week, the beginning of this lecture, and now through Hume, is a whole lot of ideas about self. Existence of self as a continuity of psychology through consciousness or memory, uh, the uh, uh, continuity of self through a physical identity, through um, split bodies, through strange amalgams of trading atoms, through uh, waking up in a parrot's body, right? That we've seen all sorts of strange and, and weird views of, of identity, what counts as a person persisting through time. And we've also seen an argument from Hume to show that there is no evidence for self, at least not clearly given his um, empiricism. Uh, but there is at least this bundle thing. And even if it's a mistake, we use it as such. So here's another like concept of what self might be. We might think that there is no self, but there's a bundle that, you know, or at least we uh, imagine that there's a bundle and, and that's enough to get us through the world. Um, Parfit examines all of these cases. He looks at body swaps. He gives us this strange atom swapping case. He looks at, um, say, uh, Peggy is teleported to Mars and exists 40 years later, but then like four of her are duplicated, right? Or say the in the first teleportation case where the machine failed to delete her on Earth, that um, it also failed to produce her on Mars until 40 years later. So now there's like an old Peggy on Earth and a young Peggy on Earth. There's so many different ways we can confuse and muddle and muddy the vagueness and trouble with in principle determining what the I that we refer to in personal identity is. And Parfit says, okay, full stop, this is a problem. Um, it, in fact, the book is like 350, 400 pages and uh, the first like two thirds of it are just going through all of these cases and showing how problematic, muddy and vague the concept of identity is. And the last third, uh, is a rejoinder, a positive account. It's like, okay, let's change the game, change the debate. We're thinking about this problem in the wrong way. Parfit says we need to stop worrying about identity and begin caring about survival because if we're worried about identity, we're gonna run into these problems. Where the principles of identity say that things can't persist through change. And if we do try to make them persist through change, we get all sorts of weird vagueness. So identity is not the right target 
of our inquiry when we're interested in this topic generally. What matters to us is not some abstract criterion of self or some ephemeral and unexplainable soul that lives within us. We don't have empirical evidence for this. We don't have principal reasons. Even when we do pick out some property that we could like investigate, we get issues like this. Any thought experiment can change your intuition about what counts as the criteria for self. We can pump your intuition in three, four, five different directions until you're so confused and looped around, you think to yourself, why the hell am I here even? I could be doing much more productive things elsewhere. Um, and similar with Parfit, right? So Parfit's gonna pump your intuitions in all these directions and um, show you that that's a, you're feeling the right way, but it's because we're asking the wrong questions. Like in Indiana Jones, you're looking in the wrong spot. But we still care about the question. It's in fact, one of the most important, who am I? What am I? What is this thing? What am I that exists? You know, who am I to exist? What is that thing that I refer to that grows and lives and experiences, loves and laughs and uh, shares and feels and experiences the world? Um, we care about that question quite a lot. And as soon as we drive it towards identity, we run into confusion. But there's another way that we can drive that passion and that uh, curiosity and that's towards survival. So Parfit says, is the truth depressing? Some may find it is so, but I find it liberating and consoling when I believe that my existence was a further fact, that there was some other criterion for my identity, some psychology or some physical entity or some like right number of atoms or whatever. I seemed imprisoned in myself. My life seemed like a glass tunnel through which I was moving faster every year. And at the end of which there was darkness for soon the body would be annihilated, soon the mind would disappear. When I changed my view, the walls of my glass tunnel disappeared. I now live in the open air. There is still a difference between my life and the lives of other people, but the difference is less. I am less concerned about the rest of my own life and more concerned about the lives of others. And this is what happens when part of this, like, this moment is, I love this moment. You get so few of these in analytic philosophy, like contemporary philosophy done today, where there's like a, a poetic aside, the, 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 the investment of self into work, um, which I think is so essential to, to what philosophy has been historically through time, is therapy, is um, understanding our condition in the world. And here, Parfit steps away, steps back from his analytic back and forth, the conceptual analysis of identity, um, says, look, what matters isn't some esoteric notion of I, but rather the fact that we survive. And what's in survival is um, what matters to me. What matters to me is what's in survival. And as soon as I shift, I see and I feel this. And I think this is like just as much philosophy as any of the conceptual analysis done as well. So what is this new view? this poetic moment, this shift from identity to survival. When we body swap or are teleported through space, when we trade brains with a parrot and are reconstituted atom by atom with some other person, the self remains a jumbled mess. What lives on throughout these different forms of being is care. I give a damn about the person who ends up on Mars. Say the teleporter fails and I'm still here. I, they, they care about my life and my family, my hopes and my dreams. We all share that. Right? And that's what really matters. What, who, who cares if my memory lives on or my body lives on? What matters are what I care about. My hopes, my dreams, my family, my friends, my loved ones, the things that I'm committed to in the world. That's what matters to me. Not the esoteric ephemeral notion of self, but the actual commitments in the world. And that person that's on Mars shares those hopes and desires and fears. And if they share it, it doesn't matter who lives on just so long as they do, just so long as those commitments are being met, just so long as those goals are being satisfied, as those people, those loved ones are being loved. Survival of the self means survival of what's important to the self, however that might live on. And this is why it's like the glass uh, walls of the tunnel disappearing, no longer being trapped in myself, says Parfit, when we start to care about survival rather than about identity. It's because 
when we care about survival, if some part of me lives on and satisfies what I'm committed to, then great. And if I die and this mind and this body go away, if I'm completely annihilated, as Hume seems to think, uh, uh, th there is no soul, there is no afterlife, e even if that's the case, there will still be uh, the, the people that I love who I made an impression on, that I live on in that way, even minimally through them, that my works in the world, the fact that I had any sort of ripple at all, even, even if it's minute and small, the fact of your historical place in the history of existence, in, in the, the span of being, right? Um, you've made an impression, you've shifted things. And whether that shift is small or large, personal or public, what matters to identity is not the thing that's vague, but the fact that you were, that you care, and that those cares continue to be satisfied, met, and live forward. And that's part of it. I think that's um, a nice way to treat uh, the trouble with the vagueness of identity. So that's, that's why we ended there. The end. Next week, we do human nature. So we'll read uh, Mengzi, Shunzi, and Laozi. Mengzi and Shunzi are both Confucians. Um, you might know Mengzi as Mencius. Kungzi, Confucius, Mengzi, Mencius. It's a Latinization. Uh, the Zi uh, just means master. So like Master Meng or Master Shun, Master Lao, right? Um, and Lao is a Taoist. Uh, it's a lot of reading. So, I mean, do it all, right? But if you're going to skip out on stuff, um, do the Mengzi Shunzi because you get a really nice uh, compare contrast because they're both Confucians. They're coming from the same school of philosophical intuitions. But Mengzi thinks that human nature is good and Shunzi thinks it's bad. And so they're using their, the, the philosophical school um, in opposing sorts of ways, uh, which is interesting. And then the, the Lao Tzu reading is all sort of um, poetry that might be hard to read. I think it's beautiful, I, I love it. Um, but that's for next week. Uh, and then the week after that, we'll do the midterm and midterm review and then move on with the class. Um, let me stop the recording there, uh, if I can. Um... Uh...